But here's the message. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. So in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one, but usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So, you know, to the degree those executives higher up are making decisions on intuition or gut feel or their so-called sixth sense, the organization is at risk. Hello and welcome to Tech for Finance, where we help finance professionals leverage technology to level up their lives. I'm your host, Adam Shilton, and I'm very excited today as we have a seasoned expert in the realm of analytics and performance management, Gary Cockins. As the founder and CEO of analytics-based performance management in Cary, North Carolina, USA, Gary's influence in the accounting and finance sector is extensive with a rich history of consulting roles at leading firms like Deloitte, KPMG, and EDS. With an impressive 16-year tenure at SAS, one of the front runners in business analytics software, Gary has cemented himself as a global authority in enterprise and corporate performance management brackets, EPM and CPM, and business analytics methods. Alongside his corporate career, Gary is also an accomplished author of blogs, articles, books. Some of his book titles are Performance Management, Integrating Strategy Execution Methodologies, Risk and Analytics, Predictive Business Analytics, and Activity-Based Cost Management, an executive's guide. They're published by John Wiley and Son, so make sure to check them out. I'll put the links in the show notes as well. But in his spare time, Gary enjoys reading business journals, watching sports, um, and was a two-year varsity football player at Cornell University. So you're a linebacker, weren't you? Very, very good. But uh, no, before we start, if you like what you hear today, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube. But Gary, so it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, Adam, for in- inviting me. It's a- my pleasure. No, no worries at all. So, so I mean, we'll go straight into it, but keen to learn a little bit more about you. Obviously, you know, people probably might know who you are already, but for those that don't, do you, do you want to, you know, just give a bit of an overview? Because I think you started your career more in sort of the, the financial controlling space and, and operations, but then before then moving over to, to more of the tech side. So do you want to give a, a few minutes worth of run through for everyone? Yeah, yeah. Well, my undergraduate was in 1971, a bachelor of science in operations research industrial engineering from cornell university where i played football <laughs> and i got my mba at northwestern university's kellogg um i uh, meant school of management so if you're doing anybody's doing the math i'm 74 years old but i feel like i'm 44 and i'm having fun um <laughs> yeah i did have my first almost decade was in a big manufacturing conglomerate in the u.s fmc link belt um and then I moved on to Deloitte, seven years, KPMG, uh, EDS, which is now part of uh, Hewlett Packard, all in consulting roles. And yes, I was 16 years with SAS. And many don't recognize what SAS, SAS. Actually, SAS is the world's largest privately owned software vendor, 15,000 employees here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And they are the real specialist in data science and business analytics. I was raised in Chicago, Illinois. The people from the U.S. will know this, go Cubs, go Bears, go White Sox. But people in all the other countries, uh, you know, when you say football, they think, oh, it's soccer. No, that's, you know, there's soccer and then there's American football. Um, I'd want to say something, though, Adam. I think careers have a lot more to do with luck and Mm. circumstances than being smart and competent. I had two lucky breaks. The first one was... When I was 27 years old, I was a financial division controller for this FMC link belt in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And after a couple of years in that role, I had the chance to become the operations manager in the facility. And I used the phrase, I then had to eat the accounting data that I had previously been serving as the accountant upstairs. (laughs) And I found much of that information to be at best useless and at worst dysfunctional and misleading. And that was a real wake up call to me about the difference between external financial statutory reporting for government regulators and uh, the investment community and internal management accounting used by managers and executives for insights to make better decisions. My second lucky break was in 1988, KPMG struck an exclusive contractual relationship with Harvard Business School professor Robert S. Kaplan. And many listening now, we go, oh, yeah, Kaplan, creator of the Kaplan and Norton balance scorecard. 
and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that. But he did the early pioneering work in activity-based costing. He wrote a really important book in the 70s called Relevance Lost, The Decline of Management Accounting. Mm -hmm. And so I got recruited from Deloitte. And I loved being with Deloitte, uh, but to KPMG, because I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to be trained by the master. Mm -hmm. And for five years, I did nothing but implement activity-based costing. And then I wrote a book called The ABC Manager's Primer, and that led to more books and the rest is sort of history. My career sort of shifted to kind of evangelist, uh, educator, hopefully inspirer, you know, then going up the corporate ladder to be a high level executive. So a little bit of background with all of that with me. Hmm. And I, I, I still I'm, I'm in awe of where your enthusiasm and your energy comes from. Um, you, you pick out, you know, you feel like you're 44, even though you're 74. I mean, is it is it that sort of, um, is it because you're still fired up by this stuff that you've got that sort of um, youthful energy or is it something to do with diet, exercise? I mean, <laughs> how, how do you keep going? Many people will have retired by now, right? <laughs> this is a, I'm going to connect some links here. What <laughs> motivates me? And I'll get to what motivates me, but I'll precede it. I'm Greek American. My last name is actually Kokinos. Okay. My parents had a delicatessen in the suburb of Chicago. What else? We're Greeks. We, I was raised in a 1600 square foot apartment above my mom and dad's deli. Oh, wow. but my mom and father taught me and my brother. It's all about customers. You know, we had, we had, it was a delicatessen grocery store, but hmm. we did have a counter there and lunch meat and so forth. I want to shift this. It's all about customers. To me, it's all about line managers mm. being provided better information for them to provide, to have insights, to make the decisions. Mm. The problem is many of the CFOs and the accountants are in the 1970s. Mm. They are not progressive. There's an imbalance. They are wake too concerned about the statutory reporting I mentioned, not enough about the internal management accounting. We have to reshift that imbalance. And so what drives me is the more I can educate managers and executives how to, why they should be implementing these enterprise and corporate performance management methods, EPM, CPM is the acronym. Mm. But as they do, then the beneficiary is the line managers and maybe even employee teams because now they can help improve their operational performance and mm. the financial performance of their organization. And public sector, I, some of this all applies to government. You know, they may not be trying to make a profit and, you know, they don't have customers, they have citizens, but many of the same methodologies uh, converge and are as applicable to public sector government as they are for commercial organizations. So the answer is, I just want to help line managers and I will do it to my dying day. <laughs> Very good. And, and hopefully, obviously, this this platform helps you do just that. So, you know, it should, should be great. So uh, you, you said there that, you know, some are still stuck in the 1970s. Obviously, um, I'm sure the people listening to, to this podcast, thing is it's called Tech for Finance, I'm hoping they're, they're the ones that are maybe a little bit future focused, or at least the ones that want to start thinking in that way. But why, why do you think people are still a bit stuck? You know, is it a mindset, mindset shift? Do they not know where to start? What, what are you seeing and what have you seen over the, the many years you've been doing this? So I'll rephrase the question. What are the barriers and obstacles that are slowing the adoption rate? of Go these on. various methods. And, and later we'll get to what the methods, but I think just to clarify, EPM and CPM is not a process, it's not a system, it's the integration, think of it as gears and machine of multiple improvement methods, yeah. cost and profitability, I'll just to some examples, cost and profitability analysis, strategy management and execution with KPIs, enterprise risk management, process improvement, including like lean management, Six Sigma quality, um, driver-based budgeting and rolling financial forecasts. There's five and there's several others. When you seamlessly integrate them, they're very powerful. Okay. The problem is many organizations aren't implementing any of them. And, the, and those who might put in one or two or three, 
they put them in an isolation of each other. So you got the risk management people in one part of the building. You got the profit and pricing people in another part of the building. You got the process from another part of the building. You get a lot more power and synergy when you integrate them, and even more power if you embed analytics into each of the methods, analytics of all flavors, regression, correlation, clustering, segmentation, hmm. and you know, and the like. So let's get to the barriers. One of them is just resistance to change. It's hmm. human nature. You know, people like the status quo. Only babies like change, you know, diapers. <laughs> um, other obstacles, fear of others knowing the truth. Oh, I don't want the accountants to truly calculate what the cost of my department are or what profits are of my, that I'm a product manager. I don't want anybody to know that. Fear of being held accountable, fear of being measured. Mm -hmm. Weak leadership, there I said it, you know, not every organization's executive team has the highest IQs. So notice all the items I just mentioned in the last 45 seconds have nothing to do with technology, nothing to do with systems, nothing to do with software. It's all about people. Mm. So it's really needed, and we can talk about it later, is behavioral change management. But the problem is, whether it's IT people, tech people, accounting people, very few have degrees from the university in psychology or sociology. They're all Newtonians. I'm a Newtonian. What do I mean by that? I like Isaac Newton, the physicist. Mm. To us, the world's a big machine. Give me the levers, pulleys, dials. What we need to get that buy-in and overcome the resistance to be somewhat Darwinian, Charles Darwin, you know, it's mm. an organism, sense mm. and respond. And we need those soft skills to get the buy-in. Mm. Mm. And that, I suppose that relates to one of the points that, that I've seen you talk about recently, which is that overcoming resistance. And I think you've got a bit, you've got a bit of a formula, haven't you? Do, do, I've got that correct D, D, V, F, and R. Do you want to take us through that? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a formula that I learned many years ago. It's called D times V times F is greater than R, where R stands for resistance. And do not underestimate the magnitude of R. It's large. Yeah, yeah. So, so if D, V, and, or F are zero or very small since they're multiplicative, the yeah. left side is not going to overcome the resistance. So everybody's asking, what's D, V, and F? Well, I'm glad you all asked. I'll tell you. <laughs> D stands for discomfort with the current state, dissatisfaction. <clears throat> Unless people have some sort of pain or discomfort, they're not interested in changing. Hmm. V stands for a vision of what better looks like. Hmm. So if they've got big D, big pain in abundance, they're looking for the lifeline. They're looking for the lifeboat. And V is the solutions. V is these various methods that I, I'll get deeper into what's in those methods of profitability reporting, strategy, and so forth. So you think if I've got big D and big V in abundance, we're going to overcome resistance. But F is the sleeper. Mm. F stands for first practical steps. Because if they believe your solution is over, th overly theoretical or unaffordable or impractical, they're not basically going to want to proceed. Mm. Now, in my career, um, I sort of changed as the years went by in consulting, I mean, candidly, early, I was a bit of a know-it-all. You know, I had these nice degrees in Ivy League University, a, a Northwestern Kellogg MBA, uh, you know, and I would, and I had learned how to do things. And so maybe I was a little bit boasting when I'd be interact with people. Here's how you do it. Where I reversed is I said, no, the trick to creating change is to ask questions. And, and you can demonstrate how your competency by the quality of the questions you ask. So rather than saying, here's the answer, here's the question. And the and pain questions fall into the equation I just, the formula that I just described. They're that, they're that D. So examples of questions of the executives. Does everybody understand the strategy of the executive team? Are we measuring the right things? Do we know where we make or lose money? Do we know which customers are more or less profitable and why? Notice just those four questions. And I've got actually people want to email me 
uh, 16 of those questions, they're all intended to kind of create that discomfort of the executives. We call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and yeah. doubt. Yeah, yeah. And and by and now it can be career limiting. You got to be careful. You don't want to basically say, "I'm going to go to the CEO and ask him those questions," and they'll be looking at you, say, well, "How do we get rid of this person?" Uh, <laughs> but uh, but that's part of the soft skills. But creating discomfort is really a key to overcoming resistance to change. Hmm. And something you mentioned there, you know, one, one of the examples you gave was, you know. Um, we're not measuring the the right things, for example. What advice would you give to people if they just don't know where to start? You know, and we can we can talk a little bit about data because I know you've spoken about that in the past. But there may be some younger teams that are thinking, right? Well, you know, we want to make these better decisions, and we know that we need um, you know better metrics, better data, but they might not know where to start. So, have you got any thoughts on that? Let me take it in in reverse order. Yeah. Uh, before I say how to how to get started. Let's talk about why to get started <laughs> before we get to the how. Yeah. And so when I think of metrics, what comes to my mind is the strategy map and the balance scorecard that were created by Dr. Kaplan, mm -hmm. the Harvard Business School, and Dr. David Norton. Now, there's other strategy management and execution tools. There's the Michael Porter, Five Forces, and there's OKRs, and um, there's the Blue Ocean strategy and so forth. But I'm going to stick with the strategy map balance scorecard. What Kaplan and Norton recognized, and I'll get to the measures, but let me sort of set it up. What Kaplan and Norton realized is that executives were overreacting to financial results reported at the end of the fiscal period. They said, you need to shift your attention to non-financial metrics collected and reported during the period so you can react to them. And you're, this is a little bit of a primer. I'm going to be a little bit of a professor here. So the strategy map, the way they designed it, it has these four perspectives that have cause and effect relationships from the bottom to the top. And in each of the four perspectives, you would define two or three what are called strategic objectives. And so... The lowest one is learning and or growth and innovation. And so if the employees are accomplished, those will contribute to the second perspective, which is the process improvement perspective. If they're accomplishing those strategic defined, it'll go to the third level, which is the customer retention and loyalty. And then ultimately at the top is the financial perspective. So that addresses the reacting to the financial result the other period. The other reason they've created it is most managers and employees do not understand the executive team strategy. I mean, for example, if I walked into those people who are listening to me, if you're, if you're a consultant and say, contact me directly, I can share with you how to implement these methods. But if, if I walked into what your, org your organization and randomly interview 10 employees in the hallway and said, quick, three minutes, can you articulate your executive team strategy to me? How many of them could do it well? Mm -hmm. Maybe none. So, <laughs> so, so if the employees and managers don't understand the executive team strategy, then how do we expect them to understand what they do each week, each month, each quarter contributes to execution of the strategy? And incidentally, the reason this is important is because one of the major frustrations of executives is failure to successfully implement their strategy. There's some empirical evidence on this. There's a Chicago-based executive recruiting firm called Challenger Gray and Christmas. They monitor the involuntary turnover of CEOs in North America, the firings of CEOs. It's been increasing every year. Okay. So what accounts for that? Well, I think post Enron, if people remember that the Enron meltdown that Arthur Anderson got, you know, crashed, um, most board of directors take their governance job far more seriously. Mm -hmm. So if a CEO is not executing the strategy, they're gone. The good example would be Carly Fiorini at Hewlett Packard. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave her a couple of years to implement. She didn't. Boom. You know, they canned mm -hmm. her. So um, now when we get to the KPIs, once the strategic objectives are defined in the strategy map, uh, and I'm going to get to how to get started. Uh, 
<laughs> the, uh, the next question that people try to skip past because they want to go right for the KPIs, the next question is what are the projects or initiatives that will accomplish that strategic objective or in some case a core process we must get better at? Mm-hmm. Once that's done, then comes the third question, what would be a metric or measure, key performance indicator, that we could monitor the progress of accomplishing those objectives so that they all like in harmony or in sync working together, you know, like musicians, instruments in an orchestra, you know, accomplishes the strategy. Mm. Now, there is a little issue here. Some organizations measure everything, you know, if it moves, they measure it. And they try to put that into their balanced scorecard. So the net result is, in fact, I've asked some, I often ask companies that allegedly claim they got a balanced scorecard, how many KPIs do you have? They'll say, well, 200, other 200, that's great. How can they all be a K? How can they all be a key performance indicator? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get too deep into it. You, You can have what are also called OPIs operating performance indicators. Hmm. They may, they're may they not like KPI. KPI definition, monitoring the progress towards accomplishing the strategic objectives. So KPIs are for strategy execution. Hmm. OPIs are for you know feedback, customer survey, satisfaction survey, cycle time reduction, cost improvement, waste and ruin. You know, they're all measures. They're all important. It's just KPIs and OPIs serve different purposes. So, hmm. all right long preview to how to get started, Mm. at least on this one. But in general, all of my methods involve something called rapid prototyping with iterations. Okay. You can think of them as pilot projects or proof of concept. People are familiar with that. But my rapid prototyping techniques all start with a one or two day workshop with a handful of five, 10, six, seven people in a room in one day or build a very quick, I'll we'll call it a model. The model of, will evolve into a permanent repeatable production system, but we want to start with a model because everything's modeling. And um, Holly, the strategy map example, I'm going to have to get a little detailed, but it always works is I have the executives the night before fill out 20 yellow post-its, you know, these little post-its yeah. with SWAT, with strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Then in the morning, when they come into the meeting, the workshop, across the wall, left to right, are the four perspectives, learning and growth and innovation, process, customer, financial. I say, take your yellow, your 20 yellow posters, put it under one of those four. They will fall under one of the four. Hmm. Next, I say to them, all of you go to the wall without talking to each other, which is tricky with executives. Look at the yellow post-its that others and you have post and look ones that are similar. And since these are sticky, you know, you can move them off the wall, put them in a different spot. And what's amazing about a half hour later, once they're done, there are two to three clusters of yellow post-its in each of the four perspectives. So three times four, three per each, 12 strategic objectives. Boom. 10 o'clock in the morning, we've already got your strategic objectives. Mm. Now, the next hour, couple hours, one by one for each one, what would be a project or initiative to accomplish that? <clears throat> and then in the afternoon, after the projects and initiatives or core process to improve, now we go back to each one and say, what would be a metric we could monitor the progress and that you could put a target on targets are also important targets are like you know the donk and the mule with the carrot when you when you put a target on a kpi and hold someone accountable for meeting attaining or exceeding the target mm-hmm. you know we have them take a quick stab at the kpi they're done i leave i tell them You've got two choices now. You can come back tomorrow and go slowly, more slowly than what I ru- I rushed you through. I just wanted you to see what a strategy map and a balanced scorecard will look like. Mm. But your other option, which I advocate to them, is now that you've got the strategic objectives and the strategy map done, delegate it to your first-line managers. 
and give them a week for them to look at the objectives, for them to identify the projects and initiatives, and for them to identify the KPIs. Mm. Why do I advise that? A couple of reasons. One, for those managers you delegated to, the net result is they're going to understand the executive team's strategy. And remember the 10 people in the hallway who yeah, could. Yeah. But the other is they're going to be held accountable to achieve the targets. Well, they came up with the KPIs. It wasn't the other way. It wasn't the executives came up with them and kind of like ran them down their throat and said, you know, I'm going to, this is the KPI and I'm going to measure you. They they developed the KPIs. So that's going to help with the accountability. And, and the net result is if they're accountable, they're re- achieving or exceeding their targets, guess what? All of their behavior is and priorities are being aligned and the strategy can be successfully executed. And that goes back to the major frustration of executives, failure to implement the strategy. So that was the how to and how to get started. I can talk later about how to get started with cost and profitability reporting, but I'll wait if you ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Now, I just um, I wanted to put a, a bit of a, a bit of a tech spin on on what you've just said there. Right? Um, so, and, and what I find is, you know, depends on what the existing setup is, right? So um, they've gone through that um, process. So they've got the strategic objectives, and they're now at the point where they've now got KPIs. So there's then, if it relates to data, for example, you know, so what insight do we need to get that we don't have? They've then got the option of saying, right, well, can we get that from our existing systems? Or do we need to create a project to go out and find a system that can facilitate that important metric that we need to to capture? So I suppose the question is, from, from your work, do you find that in a lot of instances, people already have the data and they're just not thinking hard enough about it? Or is it is it more the fact that actually people don't don't know what they don't know and they might not have it at all? I, I don't know what your experience suggests. It's a little bit of the latter. And uh, I know, you know, in a, when you and I plan for this mm. podcast, I've t- said that there's a difference between data and information. Yeah. And you you convert data into information. Um, Data tends to be transactional. In an accounting system, the payroll, accounts payable, receivable, uh, general ledger stuff, production and inventory control, you know, usage of materials and so forth. Incidentally, don't accuse me of talking manufacturing as if in the United States, only eight out of every 100 jobs make products. The other 92 are services, bank loans, policies. So Mm. everything that's in EPM and CPM is applicable to service organizations as well as, you know, you know, manufacturers and, and the like. I look at, and I'm not an expert in the IT world, Mm. uh, even though I was with SAS for 16 years, but, (laughs) you know, you go from data collection to data management, you know, quality improvement, ETL, extraction, transform, and load, all of that kind of stuff. But eventually you start moving sort of up this staircase to using the data or converting the data into the information. Mm. So then this is where commercial software tools come into play. Mm. Um, You know, in my world, since I'm predominantly in the finance and accounting world, you know, we refer to it as FP&A, financial planning and analysis. And, you know, and I know all of the various software vendors, and I think it would be inappropriate for me to start naming names. You Agreed. know, Agreed. you know, in, in the end, uh, they're calculation engines, but mm-hmm. they're important engines because, like, for example, to do profitability, which maybe we'll get you know, to later, you have to calculate the costs. Uh, little background, expenses and costs are not the same thing. People may think they are, but no, expenses defined are when the organization exchanges money with third parties, like writing a check to pay a supplier or payroll, pay an employee, all, it's like writing a check, but all costs are calculated. So a process cost, a product cost, a service line cost, you're taking those salary, wages, rent, utility expenses and you're converting them into 
all right, how then do, does the different products consume those expenses to become, you know, calculated costs? Mm. So in, a, in the end, costing is modeling. I tell the accountants, costing is not T accounts and journal entries. That's, you know, the world they live with debits and credits. So I think I'm answering your question. What's needed is commercial tools. There's also enterprise resource planning. Of course, everybody knows who kind of like the predominant one from Germany, you know, is, but there's other, there's other ERP tools, but those tools, you know, they've extracted the data, they've clear, you know, cleansed the data. That's where ETL comes into place. And now they then start converting it like production inventory control, forecasting, um, back to the accounting, profitability reporting. So uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but, but, you know, tools are really key. Now, I will mention something. When you're using those tools, it's not like a bunch of toggle switches on, off, and so forth. You have to design the model. And I often say a fool with a tool is still a fool. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. A fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, art, craft, science, building these models is a craft like a plumber or a carpenter. Mm. And I, I, I guess I would say I'm a master craftsman because I've been constructing activity-based costing models that became systems for 20, 30 years. I've done a hundred of them. I know what I'm doing, but, um, but the software is the enabler. You can't do this stuff in spreadsheets or Excel. You mm. hit the wall columns to rows too quickly. They don't have the flexibility. So Long answer to your short question. You need you need the software tools. That's where technology fits in. Yeah, and, and just to I guess add a little bit more context to, to the question is a lot of people immediately jump to I don't have this, I need something new. Whereas what I should imagine is actually going through that exercise that you mentioned previously, there is probably quite a lot that you can do with the tools that you already have in place, right? And it comes down to, again, what are we solving for? Yeah, because there's no point in getting distracted by the latest buzz or the latest trend if it doesn't move you closer to those strategic objectives that, that you mentioned previously, right? The the only thing that, that I would say as well is um, pick your battles and kind of categorize into short-term and long-term thinking. So what, what do I mean by that? So let's say that we've got a, a massive gap in data for, you know, where, where we're spending. Yeah, so, so we've got 200 suppliers, really difficult to do stuff like, you know, the purchase price variance, all, all of that good stuff, just because we don't have the data. Short term objective might be just to get a tool in place that supports that exercise, you know, like, a, like an AP tool, for example, right? But long term might be a migration to a more mature EPM platform. You see what I mean? But before we do that, we've got to rank, right? You know, and we've got to ensure, and I know you've spoken about this at length as well, is that the return's there before we jump headlong into any of these projects, right? Am I making sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't care. Well, what I like what you said is we need to know what we're solving for. The mm -hmm. way I always phrase that, Adam, is work backwards with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Know the problem or opportunity, you know, to be addressed. And where this leads to is decision management. And I think that's really, and I like that some of the business schools, at least in the U.S., I'm not that familiar with them over in, in Europe and, and some of the other countries, but Stanford, Harvard, Wharton at University of Pennsylvania, Kellogg, my University of Chicago booth, you know, they actually will have like decision management as part of the curriculum now. It didn't used to be there, you know, several years ago. So, all of this stuff is intended for, for, you know, making better decisions. The data to information, the information is really, you know, data, it's hard to really draw insights from just looking at racked and stacked columns and rows. Yeah. And, and I want to get into visualization. That's where visualization kind of comes into play. Pie charts, histograms, you know, like, because with visualization, you can, the brain can more quickly interpret what would have been columns and rows. Visualization is important. You know, your mother said looks are not everything. Well, 
she lied. (laughs) (laughs) We need, we need those looks, you know, but the commercial packages still need that craftsman, Mm -hmm. the craft of designing the model so that high quality, high transparency, high visibility, high clarity, reasonable accuracy. Notice I said reasonable accuracy. That's yeah. that's another problem with the accountants. They are so have hung up on precision and detail that they, they just want everything to reconcile to the to the penny or the euro. You know, we have a phrase with activity-based costing, it's better to be approximately correct mm. than precisely inaccurate, you know. So um, the 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 use of information really depends on the type of problem, you know, that you want to solve. A whole other issue would be how do you prioritize, but we could pull that to later or maybe another podcast (laughs) because there's so many problems. Well, that's another interesting thing. When you do these EPM and CPM methods, people see a lot more that they've never seen before. Mm. And in some cases it's real contrary to their belief system. I mean, for example, if they think, oh, our largest customer in sales must be our most profitable customer. No, when you start delving into it and measuring, you discover your largest customer may be high maintenance customer, always changing delivery schedule, always buying special, not standard, always calling help desk, always returning goods. You start collecting all that, you'll discover, wait, they may be our largest in sales, but they're not even close to being our most profitable. These other ones that are the angel customers. So you get you know, get the idea. We need we need to create the models effectively so that now line managers, executives, employee teams can see the information. Hmm. And what so talking about the models there, and I appreciate we've gone uh, off the beaten track a little bit, but earlier on in the conversation, you you mentioned um, various forms of analysis. So you, so you mentioned uh, regression, clustering, and, and that sort of stuff. Obviously, there's a there's a big effort to make sure that the data is in the right place in the right format before you can start getting into those more advanced analytic methods. What do you think the, the threshold is? You know, do, is there like a minimum viable amount of data before you can start doing proper modeling? Or can you sort of get started with some of that analysis with maybe a smaller data set? Oh, I think you can get by with less. Okay. Um, what's more important is to start getting the skills. You know, it's kind of iterative. Mm. Um, the skills to do regression, correlation, segmentation, clustering. And I know some of the people listening to you and I right now are saying, oh, golly, I took those courses in college. I just want a passing grade and get the heck out, get the heck out of there. Well, <laughs> sorry, it's yeah. here, data science. But the good news is to you listening to me, you don't need to go to your attic or basement and dig out your old college textbook, but you do need some skill sets in your organization that have those capabilities, mm. you know, because data science is really, you know, it's a competitive advantage. One book that if people want to do a Google search 10 years ago was authored by Dr. Um, Tom Davenport from Babson College called Competing on Analytics. Mm. I'll repeat that, Competing on Analytics. He co-authored it with a Jeannie Meister of uh, Accenture, who's now retired. Um you you get you, you the you can start with a little bit of data. And then, but start using the methodology, the analytical technique, regression, correlation, whether you're doing forecasting or or trying to understand relationships between different variables, that's the definition of correlation. Um, And then if, wait a second, this doesn't seem to be sufficient, then you could say, well, well, let's go back and increase the quantity or size or scope of the data that when I said it's kind of a loop, you know, so for, to me, it's, get going. I always have a sense of urgency, you know, you know, ready, fire, aim kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> if you will move fast. Um, most organizations over plan and under execute, which is my observation. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I suppose it, it ties to what you're saying earlier as well, when we're talking about that, you know, we, we need data in the period as live as possible to be able to make decent decisions, right? And, and may, maybe that plays to your point on accuracy as well. May, maybe it's, not just about accuracy, but it's also about timing. So what's the minimum viable data that we can basically surface to make a decision in the moment 
And then what is the minimum viable data if we're thinking more compliance year end, that sort of stuff, because there's, there's probably differences, right? You know, you might want to be absolutely to the penny bang on when it comes to, to the official stuff. But in terms of just keeping that steer, in terms of making sure that we're headed in the right direction, yeah, yeah, data might not be need to be 100% accurate to at least make a decent decision, right? No, you're correct. You're correct. You know, for the external financial statutory reporting for the government regulators, you're correct. You get those numbers wrong, you go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but if you get the management accounting numbers wrong, you don't go to jail, you know? So it's okay to be 95% accurate. The issue is when people do, and we're kind of getting the activity-based costing, I don't want to dwell on it, the traditional management accounting method, big problem is what's called overhead, overhead cost allocations. And the accountants get really lazy. They take this overhead and they allocate it for product or service line costs, like spreading butter across bread. You know, so they use these denominator cost allocation factors, like in manufacturing number of labor hours or number of units produced or uh, sales amount or square feet or square meters or number of employees per department and so on and so forth. None of those reflect the unique consumption that the products and service lies consume of the end to end processes and the work activities that belong to them which in turn draw on those expenses and the capacity. Activity-based case costing solves that because it decomposes the indirect expense, which is what overhead is, and then it traces and assigns them with the cause and effect relationships. Mm. The causality principle is so fundamental. It's, you know, you got to have cause and effect relationships. So that gives the more reasonable information. It doesn't have to be perfect, just good enough for people to get insights from and to make the better decisions. I like what you said there about cause and effect. Although sometimes we can attribute the wrong cause to an effect, right? You know, so that, yeah, you were about that's to say a, that. that, that <laughs> that's, you know, a subset of correlation is correlation is not causation. Right. And you got to be careful just because, you know, a regression line, you know, Clusk goes straight. Well, it doesn't mean that this is causing that. You've got to be a little careful. I do want to make a point, though, that I should have made. When, we, when I said we go from data to information, what we also want to get is that information is the facts. I'm not going to say, well, maybe, maybe information and facts should be synonymous. Mm. But here's the message. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. So in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one, but usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So, you know, to the degree those executives higher up are making decisions on intuition or gut feel or their so-called sixth sense, the organization is at risk. You know, and we've had some bankruptcies here in the U.S. We've had some recent bankruptcy, Bed Bath & Beyond, Toys R Us, other bankruptcies in the past. I think part of it is the accountants are not providing reasonably accurate cost and profit margin analysis. And the, uh, the executives are basically re replying on gut feel. Yeah, what, what I found is more often than not it comes down to who can shout the loudest <laughs> um who's banging on the table that the loudest right um obviously my, my experience is is tech implementations you know um software consulting that that sort of stuff which which i still do um but you know an important factor in sales is are you speaking to somebody who can sell on your behalf internally and that's not just limited to selling software that's limited to everything you know so, so how how well can your idea be sold internally um and i always love the film inception even though there's a load of holes that I always end up digging in it um because the whole <laughs> point of inception is is planting that seed and and having that seed grow um obviously unfortunately as you said if it's the wrong seed and it's false then you know something false also has the potential to grow with something true, which is why we need to arm ourselves with 
all of the jazzy stuff that enables us to argue that point. Because I'm sorry, but words on a piece of paper distributed during, you know, a meeting are not going, it's not going to win hearts and minds, is it? You know, whereas you said previously, you know, um, visualization and making it real is, is more important than ever now, I think. Um, and going back to what we've said, it's not just more important, it's the speed as well that we need to get, get hold of that information because the quicker we can move, the more chance we have of sort of outpacing the, the competition with some of these strategic decisions, right? Yeah. I d- often do guest lectures for university faculty for their students. And, mm-hmm. you know, I kind of tell them, here are some of the important traits for you to be successful later in your career. And one of them, which is you just mentioned, communication, the ability mm-hmm. to communicate. You were saying how to sell, but selling really is a form of communication, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. But there's another aspect that can regrettably, sadly, impact the young students' careers as they move on. It's leadership, who they're working under. And let me just mention my thoughts about leadership. I think in the past, the best leaders and the best executives had the best answers. Mm-hmm. Today, I do not think that's the case. Today, I think the best leaders and best executives have the best questions. There's too much volatility. There's too much complexity. There's too much uncertainty for them to rely on their, again, gut feel or intuition or or the types of decisions that they made successfully earlier in their career that got them promoted to the top. They need to create a culture for investigation and discovery and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you learn from the mistakes. And so I'm sort of bringing the data science and analytics back in, you know, yeah. to the picture, you know, that, that is going to be needed. And yes. Yeah, so so it is about getting the balance, right? So, so obviously we talk about business partnering quite heavily um, as it relates to tech on, on this podcast quite a lot, you know, how do you equip yourself with the tools that are going to allow you to be a better business partner uh, essentially? Um, but obviously the more curious you are the more questions you ask the more responses you get um and sometimes i feel and this 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 is just personally like you know i'll go into a meeting with an open mind you know trying to ask those curious questions to try and get better quality answers but very quickly you end up more answering asking more questions and raising more stuff than you you have the capacity to get done so maybe this relates to what you were mentioning earlier about prioritization i guess we can come back to that that strategic exercise uh, as well you know we've got 10 15 potential projects that relate to kpis supporting strategic objectives how how do we rank is it literally just a case of saying look this has the most scope to generate the most amount of revenue in the next. next. Do, do you see what I mean? How do people go about distilling that and thinking, right, well, we've, we've now essentially just landed a huge amount on our plate. How do we sift through that and prioritize? You know, I'm, I'm going to dodge that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fine. No, may, may, no, maybe not dodge, but I'm going to, I'm going to say, This is now the job of the executives. You know, you can do ROI, return on investment, and all these financial whiz things. But, you know, when it comes down to prioritization, I think there's a point that the reason those men and women are at those high-level positions is for their brains and their ability to look. So I, I say prioritization, you know, comes with them. But what I would warn them is, you know, don't focus on just, one or two and a limited number, I'm kind of back to my CPM and EPM is a system. Many of these methods, the gears in the machine, you really need a lot of them going Mm -hmm. at the same time because many organizations, if we go with this analogy, you know, some of the teeth on the gears are broken or some of the gears have been disengaged or some are, they're missing a gear, you know, but You know, and if we put that in an engine of a car and even put some sand into that, you know, the car might run, but Mm. the fuel efficiency would be low. Mm. Now replace those broken gears with titanium gears spinning at faster revolutions per minute, you know, lubricated, digitized. Now put that in your car engine. Now what's the fuel efficiency? Much higher. 
Hmm. Now replace the metaphor of fuel efficiency in a car with rate of shareholder and owner wealth creation. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going with this. Get all of these integrated methodologies together. That's why I, you know, in the beginning of my career, because of the back to the Kaplan KPMG thing, I wrote the book on activity-based costing. But then, and to just make a long story short, I wound up, Dr. Goodnight, that's the co the founder and owner of SAS, the 15,000, you know, they purchased a company I was with and I come into SAS and people say, oh, Gary Kokins, we've heard of you. You're famous. You're the ABC guy. You know, like that's all I am, you know, <laughs> and I heard, <clears throat> I heard this term performance management. I said, you know, this is more than employee appraisals. And I said, I'm a big picture person. I said, this has got to be all these pieces. And I went to my editor at John Wiley and Sons, Shekto. I said, you know, I think I can write a book. And if you go to Wiley.com and just look up my name, you're going to see all then my remaining books are Enterprise and Corporate Performance Management. So that's kind of mm -hmm. how I broadened into this. Okay. So let's let's flip a little bit. And I'm, I'm conscious of your, your time as well here, here Gary. But um we spoke earlier about that overcoming resistance piece. Um, and thanks for the formula. Again, I'll share that, uh, put that in the show notes. So that, that's really good. But let's say that we've now got, we've overcome that initial resistance, right? How do we flip that and say, how do we then reduce our chances of failure if we have committed to an EPM exercise? Is there anything that people can do to to stack the odds in their favor when they're undergoing this this transformation? Do you have any best practices to share in terms of how they can maximize the chances of success when they go through some of these exercises? I'll come back to accountability. Okay. Um, you know, usually, and I don't want to go through it now in the interest of time, I have like these eight forces that have caused interest in EPM and CPM. I've already gone through a couple of them. Strategy failure by the executives, uh, managers not trusting the management accounting data, uh, sales and marketing not knowing which customers are attractive to retain, to grow, win back, or acquire which types not, meaning customer profitability. We haven't talked about budgeting and rolling financial forecasts. That's an, an, another part of it. Uh, okay. Supply chain management needs more collaboration between trading partners. But one of them is the accountability coming back. And so you're saying, how could you basically, you know, mitigate the uh, failure? And, you know, by having the right measures, the metrics, mm -hmm. the feedback data, you know, a lot of people think that, think the balanced scorecard is what is so key back to strategy execution. To me, the strategy map is 10 times more important than the balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is a feedback. You start with the strategy map. Remember the four perspectives mm. and then all of the definition KPIs, and then the balanced scorecard becomes the feedback mechanism. You monitor. So that would be my way of uh, a detecting early on, which is what you're saying. I need an early warning mm. that I'm starting to have some sort of failure in the success of these implementations. And that's, that's interesting, actually. I've never heard it referred to that, like a, like a warning sign, like an indicator. I, I like that because I think in a lot of instances, people get, you know, really far down the process. You know, I've, I've spoken to companies that have been trying to implement new, new processes for, for four or five years, you know, obviously sometimes the odds are against them. Maybe, you know, they've had some senior staff changes, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's that reselling exercise as new people come on board and they need to be brought up to speed with, with what's going on. But I, I really like the way that you position that because instead of the, the question, how do we avoid failure? The question being, what are the indicators that could derail us or might indicate that we're about to be de derailed? There's a nicer way of thinking about it. So now, pre a pre right. perspective. I, I, I don't want to complicate matters, but right. <laughs> there's a whole community called the Enterprise Risk Management Community. Yeah. And they have what are called KRIs, Key Risk Indicators. Okay. And, um, and if people are interested, since if you go to my website, under the tabs, I have many free articles. Mm -hmm. My website is www.garycokens.com. I think you're going to provide that to him. You can look under the tabs. You'll see the integration of EPM and ERM, and you'll get a little insight. Think of key risk indicators as sort of if they start going bad, then the KPI has a lagging effect. Then the KPI is going to go bad. And once the KPI starts moving in the wrong direction, 
now it's the problem that you're talking about. How do we, you know, mitigate or reduce the likelihood of failure? Mm. <clears throat> and, 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 and feel free to, to dodge this question as well. And, but obviously, you know, <laughs> you, you've been doing this for a, a while, right? Is there anything that's, that's fundamentally changed? So obviously we, we've seen technology that's been evolving at an absolutely crazy pace. Um, previous podcast with um, with Liren, we discussed a, a key indicator being time to value in terms of system indications, you know, and, and I believe that time to value is getting shorter and shorter the more self-serve these different solutions become, right? But f- from what I picked up from this conversation, we're still sort of solving for the same problems. So, so you know, are we to say that the fundamentals haven't changed much or do you have a different differing perspective on that? Well, the fundamentals have always been there. I mean, you know, things like modeling and causality, like, you know, universal principles like speed of light and gravity, you can't change <laughs> that. And so costing, calculating proper cost is based on the principle, you know, of causality uh, there. But I thought where you were headed was on technology. And I was thinking, you know, um, I, not the whole thing going from on premises to cloud, but the speed of calculations, mm. um, and 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 the and the um, the inclusion of analytics with methodologies, making it enhancing it, it kind of amplifies you know, the information. So you know the the basics of you know good measurements, profit and loss income statements, all of that, that stuff's been around for ever since Lucas Pacioli, who was a monk and the 1400s in Italy <laughs> created double entry bookkeeping, you know, that stuff's been around forever, but from a technology standpoint, uh, speed also, I'm really big on search engines and search mm. the ability to search and find when you start doing the investigation and discovery, remember I said the executives need to create a culture for investigation discovery Boy, the ability to go look quickly. Um, and just one other observation, which is probably going to freak everybody out business intelligence and business analytics are not the same thing, but business analytics is a stage of maturity high above BI. So everybody goes, we need business intelligence, query, OLAP, online analytical processing, you know, go find an anomaly, a, you know, a line item of an invoice or purchase order or so forth. Eh, you know, that's important, but business analytics takes, you react to BI, but with business analytics, you're more proactive. You start looking at things, then you start making changes in advance as you see them. So kind of the difference between business intelligence and business analytics, they're not the same thing. Do you, do you think finance is moving into more of a, a data science type career? Um, and I know we're near the one hour. Um, the issue there is you can think of accountants or CFOs on a spectrum, mm. a continuum. Um, and I'd like to think it's a bell-shaped curve continuum mm. where at one end, they are Luddites. You know what a Luddite is, you know, just they're anti-tech. They're just, just all they want to do is not go to jail, get close the books and all that. You know, at the far end, other end of the spectrum is the real progressive ones that are being, you know, modern. So, um, I don't, you know, you'd like to think that the bell-shaped curve is moving a little towards the progressive, but it's really slow. Mm. Um, it can turn. When I do presentations, I speak at a lot of state, USA state CPA conferences because they have to get their continuing professional education hours. It, I typically in the beginning say, look, I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. <laughs> I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. You need to think like engineers when you do the types of things to support and serve your line managers and your executives. So, so I think we're near the end. How would you like to draw this to a conclusion? Um, well, the question I often ask Gary, to, to finish these, these podcasts is um, whether there's any tech or gadgets that you like to use. And, and the, the only answer you can't give is, is your mobile phone. Cause we've had that answer <laughs> a, a couple of times, but do you have like a, a phone app or anything on your computer or, or a, a gadget? I mean, we even have people saying they've got shavers <laughs> that they really like that have been suggested as gadgets. They could. Yeah, no. So have you got anything like I, that? 
No, I'm basically PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, and LinkedIn, <laughs> and email. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's good. But no, on the PowerPoint thing, if you've not checked it out, and this was a conversation that I had with uh, Suf- Sufyan Hamid, who's the presentation guy on LinkedIn a while ago, PowerPoint's now got the uh, presentation coach built into it. So it's actually got an AI tool that you can use when you run a through presentation now. So if you're not spotted that, just click on rehearse with coach and you're away. It'll give you analytics on top of that as well. So no, it's, it's really yeah, cool. Yeah. So. I, I will say this. It's really early. I, I, I'm with a, quite a few professional societies. Chat GPT can do a lot more than I realized. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be good and bad, but I know, I know. In fact, I'm writing a chapter for a book, chapter 17, I've drafted it and then they're going to run it through chat GPT and it's going to clean it up like a copy. And then I become the copy editor, what I wrote. And they said it really does a good job. So yeah. it's a, that, 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 that's it. Yeah. And, and I do, I do believe we are going to build a generation of ed- editors and analysts rather than people are doing operational stuff. You know, it's just, it's just where things are headed, but that's, that's a topic of conversation for a, for a whole, yeah. whole new day. Right. So, but you've given your, your website, Gary, so you've got to garycokins.com. Apologies for mispronouncing your name on the intro. I'm sorry about that. Um, where else can people find you? Is it just LinkedIn or? Yeah, LinkedIn. And then my email address is gcokens, no punctuation, at garycokens.com. Okay, there we go, Gary. Well, and you can say, and in and, and, and LinkedIn, I enjoy LinkedIn. Yeah, very good. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on, Gary. I really appreciate you, you spending the time. And, and maybe uh, we'll have a round two for the stuff that we didn't get to talk about. Okay, well, let me, let me end on this. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. People need transparency and visibility. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> thanks so, so much, Gary. No, that's, that's wonderful. And, and thanks again. That's amazing. All right. See you next time. Cheers.